Hello and good evening. I have some information for you guys for course develop for your course development and uh, orientation in labor and delivery. As a nurse in labor and delivery, part of your orientation will be scrubbing in the OR, and this is some information to prepare you for your days in the operating room. So uh, I know you come from different backgrounds, but what I'd like to know is what is your previous experience? Have you worked as an extern in nursing? Um, have you worked as uh, an assistant where you stock the rooms? And um, have you just observed? So I would like you to discuss that information on the discussion board. So this is a scene that I took from the NIC. Um, it was very profound to me as a labor and delivery nurse to see um, what they had to work with. Um, this patient had a uh, bleeding that was unexplained it was an abruption and um, they did a c-section with their they just put a solution over their hands that considered themselves clean and they cut this woman and they had a pump that was pumping the blood and so it was um, a nice way to just include this in what used to be and of course the woman died and back then it was a very high mortality rate with childbirth. So right now, this is uh, a standard OR um, and standard gear that you would wear, such as your hats, your masks, your gowns, your gloves, sterile gloves, and, um, you know, the protective gear for your eyes, uh, shields, uh, glasses, and it's very important. Um, some of the solutions that we use in the OR are pictured here, and one of them um, that is the most important solution is chlorhexidine. Uh, chlorhexidine is used for most operative procedures in labor and delivery if it is not an emergent uh, situation. And because when you prep the area with chlorhexidine, there is a three-minute drying time. So that's why you would never use it in an urgent or emergent situation. Um, if it's a DNC or uh, an emergent situation, then you would use betadine um, it, um, because there is no drying time for betadine. Um, as far as uh, your solutions for irrigation, for to keep your sponges moist, we use sterile water. Um, unless otherwise directed by the physician. And there's a picture of sterile water and saline. And these are all for irrigation. So it's different from the normal IV fluids that you would see for normal saline. And it says on the bottle, sterile irrigation solution. As far as the um, data about C-section, it is the most commonly performed surgical procedure in the United States. It has a mortality ratio of 14.5% of uh, deaths and um, approximately 10% results in postpartum infection. What we can do as uh, practitioners in labor and delivery is be very conscientious about your scrubbing and about hand washing, uh, especially in between patients and before every procedure. Just be very conscientious about it. Um, this is the way you would hold your hands after you scrubbed for a C-section. Of course, what you would do is put on your hat, your mask, your gloves. You would go into a room, open up your instruments, uh, get your gown and your gloves, and then you would go out and scrub. And below I have put a video of a proper way to do a surgical scrub before you enter the OR and touch your instruments. As far as uh, surgical conscience, that is a very important uh, issue in the OR. Um, if you see someone contaminate themselves, then you want to tell them. Um, they might e not even realize they have done it, or it may be a first time because we have a lot of medical students and new doctors that start. So they need to uh, be taught and do it in a gentle fashion. 
um, as uh, pa a patient advocates, we must always have a strong surgical conscience to ensure that the patient has a safe perioperative experience and the patient should go home the way they came in. So part of being in the room when you're scrubbing or circulating is having patience because we are doing a lot of teaching because it's a teaching hospital and you want to observe and be aware so that you can anticipate what the next instrument is that the physician will need. This is a, I, I wanted to include this for patients that would come back because part of your documentation record has to have the classification of the room. So this is uh, simply put here for you. Teamwork makes the dream work. There are defects everywhere to uh, help you fail. So we don't want to do that. So one of the ways um, in uh, 2007, uh, the Joint Commission developed um, data. And what they said is that communication breakdowns were the leading root cause of sentinel events. So what they did was they created a fetal monitoring course for nurses and doctors so that we all learn the same way and speak the same language. So in the event of an emergency or of a deteriorating situation, you want to communicate what the situation is, what the background is, the assessment that you got, and what the re recommendation is, and when you expect the doctor to respond back. And that's called SABAR. Some of the emergencies that you'll see um, frequently are shoulder dystocias, when the baby's shoulders get stuck, a core prolapse, eclampsia, uterine rupture, and non-reassuring fetal hearts that are refractory to interventions, and also the delivery of a second twin. Anytime there is twins, there almost uh, there uh, always has to be a double setup for C-section and vaginal delivery, providing that the twins are vertex, because the second twin can always change position. So timeouts are very important in the OR. You always want to take time out to know what who's identify the patient, introduce yourself to the patient so that the patient knows, uh, agreement on the procedure to be done, uh, consents, if the patient has any allergies. You know, it's important for anesthesia to know that because they'll be administering medications. Um, uh, if the fetal scop electrode was removed, removed, and if NICU was called, and if the patient needed blood, if you want to know if the blood is available. And times. The circulator is the gatekeeper of the room. The circulator records all times, and all times come from the computer. This is a picture of a surgical checklist. And those things that I mentioned before is part of the checklist, the consents, the allergies, etc. And the attending physician for OB and the attending physician for anesthesia has to sign both. It is part of the patient's record. This is just an example of some instruments that uh, you'll see. These are the suture and blades that go along with the instruments. We most commonly use a number 10 blade, and that would be for a C-section, and a number 11 blade, blade for um, tubal ligations. These are some more instruments that um, are in a C-section tray and also in a vaginal delivery tray. So if you know these instruments, you'll be able to navigate your way through both. So there's mayos, they're straight, and they're curved. The straight ones are used to cut suture, and the curved ones are used to cut uh, tissue. And cokers are used to pull um, very heavy tissue. In Alice's, they will use to clamp the uterus. Uh, Kelly's are used to um, cauterize or tag uh, laps or e-tapes. And this is just a bigger picture of them.
and forceps. These are the forceps that the doctor will use to assist them in sewing. And it helps them to pick up the tissue. And so there are different kinds of forceps. There are smooth, which are or for delicate tissue, for example, the bladder flap. Uh, pick up with teeth, which are used for the muscle or more dense tissue. Russians, which are used for the uterus, and adsins for the skin. They're really tiny. Some retractors that are commonly used, and uh, these you will see on the C-section tray, will be Army Navies, uh, Richardson's, and Devers. And they are used to give you more visualization of the procedure. The ultimate goal for all of us is a healthy mom, a healthy, healthy baby, and a nice family experience. If you have any questions, please refer to the discussion board and I'll be happy to answer them. And I hope this will help you in your orientation. Thank you.